Coverage you can count on at 5 starts now. And right now on News 13 at 5, we'll have the latest details for you in the cross-country murder investigation we've been following involving the deaths of two emergency responders. And the Georgetown County Sheriff launched a criminal investigation following the death of an inmate. We'll tell you what could come of this criminal probe coming up. Also ahead at 5, Horry County Schools hold a special called meeting tonight. News 13's Adriana Lawrence will have a live look at what's up for discussion. Thanks so much for joining us for News 13 at 5. I'm Patsy Kelly. And first now, a Marion County man accused of killing a New Mexico State Police officer remains in the hospital today. Jeremy Smith is also a person of interest in last week's disappearance and killing of a PD paramedic. And News 13 learned today he has an extensive criminal history in South Carolina dating back 15 years. Smith was first arrested in the Palmetto State in 2007 on five counts of felony assault. Eight months later, he was convicted of grand larceny. Smith went on to pick up more than a dozen other felony charges, and by October of 2008, he was given up to six years in prison for burglary and grand larceny. But he was released in 2010, then incarcerated in 2015 for armed robbery charges. Smith was once again released in 2018 when he picked up his most recent charges of contraband possession. Authorities say Smith's from Marion County, and they say New Mexico State Police Officer Justin Hare responded Friday to reports of a driver with a flat tire near Albuquerque. Smith was also caught driving Phanasia Mikado 4's white BMW there after her body was found in Dillon County on Friday. News 13's Jackie Labrizzi is in Marion County today and joins us now live. Jackie, what more can you tell us about this investigation? Patsy, right now I'm at 1305 North Main Street in Marion. It's where the county's EMS building is and also where Mikado 4 worked part time. Authorities say 15 or excuse me, 52 year old Mikado 4 was last seen on Tuesday at her house on Wildwood Loop. That's only about 10 minutes from here. But reports say her body was found Friday night outside Lakeview in Dillon County. I reached out to the Marion County Sheriff's office, office, but they weren't available today for comment. The EMS director for Marion County, Trey Cooper, told me Mikado 4 was one of those people who always had a smile. Cooper says a couple of his EMS workers here in Marion also worked with Mikado 4 in Florence. She hadn't worked here but maybe the last four or five months, but I've known her probably for 20 years. Yeah, she, so she's always worked in this area. Like uh, she worked private transport ambulances and then um, she'd been working for Florence and I want to say she'd been at Florence for quite a while. Cooper says the people who were close to Mikado for are taking her death hard, so they're keeping a close eye on them. Coming up on News 13 at 6, Cooper talks more about the kind of person Mikado for was. Live in Mary and Jackie Labrizzi, News 13. Jackie, thank you. And in a joint statement from Dillon and Marion County authorities, an autopsy was performed today and will be a crucial piece of the investigation, though officials expect results to take several weeks. Federal and state agencies are helping in this case. And right now on WBTW.com, you can see a full timeline of uh, events detailing what's happened in the case of Phanasia Mikado 4. And new tonight, Authorities investigate and charge someone after a Georgetown County Detention Center inmate died this morning. This follows a drug overdose this weekend. Officials say 23-year-old Shelby Ashby died at Tidelands Memorial Hospital. She was one of two inmates found unresponsive in their cells on Friday. The other inmate has recovered and is back in jail. Georgetown Sheriff Carter Weaver says Kelly Lambert of Andrews has been charged with bringing a controlled substance into a facility and contraband possession. The court allowed her to serve a sentence on weekends for a traffic charge, and she was booked just before 6 p.m. on Friday. At last check, she remains in jail. And just into our newsroom, a second arrest was made in connection to a double homicide in 2021. Authorities found and arrested Tavarius Moore at a home in Fairmont early this morning. Among his charges, two counts of first-degree murder and one count of felony conspiracy. Authorities say Caleb Hunt and Jonathan Lowry were found dead in Fairmont on October 30th, 2021. One was found dead inside a vehicle, the other died outside of it. Semje Bethay was also previously arrested and charged in the case and is currently in jail waiting on his trial. And we first told you last week a woman was in the hospital in critical condition after multiple gunshots were fired into a car in Lorenberg. 
We've just learned that woman, Denver Quick, died yesterday from her injuries. It happened just after 10 p.m. last Thursday on Wagram Street. If you know anything, you're asked to contact Lorenberg Police. News 13 on time traffic, sponsored by Joy Law Firm. Just call Joy. It is 5.05 now and looking at traffic flows during the evening commute on this Monday evening. It's going to be slow, of course, on 501. That's not news to anybody who's lived in Horry County for a long time. 501 is going to be the slowest area, but even 544 is beginning to slow down just outside of coastal Carolina. The drive time on 501 is now down to seven minutes from Carolina Forest to Coastal Carolina University. 17 Mr. Joe White to 82nd Parkway is moderately delayed, taking 10 minutes currently, but I-95 is not seeing any issues. There's there's no active construction zones that are delaying anything in downtown Florence is all in the green, including West Palmetto Street and South Irby Street. For those drive times inland at 52 Palmetto to I-95 will take seven minutes. All right, Hannah, thanks so much. And a News 13 update for you now. The Florence County Coroner's Office identified the man killed in a crash over the weekend after his vehicle hit a ditch and overturned on Friday. The coroner says 64 year old William Burgess of Johnsonville died in the crash. Happened around 5.20 p.m. on Indian Town Road at Gaskin Road, about five miles south of Lake City. Burgess was driving south on Indian Town Road when his pickup truck drove off the right side of the road. He was the only person in the truck. And staying in Florence County, another crash victim was identified following a two-vehicle crash last night. The coroner's office says 56-year-old Keith Rushing died in that crash. Happened around 11.30 along East Old Marion Highway. State Highway Patrol says a car traveling south was hit by another car heading east that entered its lane. That vehicle overturned, killing rushing. No one else involved was hurt. And happening tonight, Horry County Schools plans to talk school safety. The Board of Education is holding a special cold meeting on weapons detection systems. News 13's Adriana Lawrence joins us live from outside Horry County Schools in Conway. Adriana, what exactly is on the agenda tonight? Patsy, not only is the board discussing uh, weapons detection systems tonight for discussion, but also they'll be discussing, quote, school security matters. According to the board's agenda, the weapons detection selections committee plans to give a report. The board will also choose a weapons detection system. Then in an executive session, the board will then talk about those school security matters. Last Monday, the board voted eight to three in a no confidence vote in its district security division. The school system said after it's not sure what changes or decisions would be made going forward, but school security would continue to be discussed. Many parents have spoken out on school safety since reports show a gun made it into Myrtle Beach Middle School on February 6. Coming up on News 13 at 11, I'll have a full report with how the board voted and what exactly they discussed. Live in Conway, Adriana Lawrence, News 13. Adriana, thank you. And new at five, Florence officials approved an ordinance today that will add extra punishment for anybody convicted of a hate crime within city limits. Language in the ordinance sets penalties of $500 or a maximum of 30 days in jail if a person is found guilty of committing a crime based on, quote, perceived race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, physical or mental disability, or national origin, end quote. The ordinance comes as South Carolina and Wyoming remain the only two states without a hate crimes law. And happening now, Conway City Council is holding a meeting and also just passed the consideration of a resolution encouraging the state general assembly and governor to enact a statewide hate crimes law. This makes Conway the largest city in the state so far to push for it. It was also discussed whether this should be an ordinance rather than a resolution. City Council also says it might look into doing more in the future. Last month, the House bill urged state lawmakers to enact the Clemente C. Pinckney Hate Crimes Act, but it's since stalled in the Senate. You can count on us for updates on Conway's meeting tonight on News 13 at 11. And topping national headlines, lawyers for former President Trump say it's impossible for him to post the more than $450 million bond in his civil fraud trial. He has one week to come up with the money while he appeals last month's ruling. The judge ruled his company schemed and inflated his wealth for years to help secure loans and make deals. Officials say he has to post a bond to pause enforcement of the judge judgment, which happens March 25th. And today, for the first time in more than a month, President Biden spoke with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu over the phone. The White House says the two have agreed to hold additional discussions ahead of potential invasion of Gaza's populated city. Our D.C. correspondent Raquel Martin has the story. 
The White House says Israel's prime minister has agreed to send senior officials to Washington. To hear U.S. warnings against Israel's invasion of Gaza's most densely populated city. A million people have taken refuge in Rafah. They have nowhere else to go. Despite repeated warnings from the White House, on CNN Sunday, Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to continue Israel's military campaign in Rafah to take out key Hamas targets. So we're going to continue military pressure? National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says Israel's current plan would exhaust an already dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza. We share the goal of defeating Hamas. But we just believe you need a coherent and sustainable strategy. The United Nations warns hundreds of thousands of Palestinians will starve without a ceasefire soon. Famine in the northern part of Gaza is imminent. Sullivan says the administration is still pushing for a ceasefire deal to pause fighting and release hostages, but acknowledged that effort is difficult. Hamas's uh, outlandish demands makes that deal uh, a lot more difficult. Last week, Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer, the highest ranking Jewish official in the U.S., sharply criticized Netanyahu's military strategy and called for new leadership. Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way. It was very uh, inappropriate. On Fox News Sunday, Republican Texas Congressman Michael McCall said U.S. leaders should not undercut Israel's democracy. In Washington, Raquel Martin. And still to come on News 13 at 5, we'll tell you how new executive actions from the White House plan to advance and raise standards for women's health across the country. Plus, a recall alert for you cashew lovers out there when we come back. But first, you're taking a lovely live look out over Garden City. Stay with us. News 13 at 5 is back right after this.